In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kill them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray, O God, let us instruct the hearts of the faithful, God, the of the Holy Ghost, grant us by the gift of the same spirit, that we may be truly wise, and never rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. St. Pius the Tenth, St. Isidore, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, so the past few weeks, we have been trying to understand our Lord and His human nature. Um, so we've considered the nature of the hypostatic union, that our Lord um, is a divine person. There's no human person. There's just a divine person with two natures, the human and the divine nature, and how the human nature is a real human nature with a, with a real body and a real soul. And uh, we, we saw two weeks ago how <clears throat> that human nature, even though it belongs to a divine person, it, it still has need of grace, of sanctifying grace, in order to perform supernatural activities. Um, and then last week, we considered the, the knowledge that is possessed by our Lord in His human nature, three types of knowledge that our Lord possessed in His human nature. Remember those three types of knowledge? Um, seems like a long time ago. It was, sorry? Infused knowledge. Infused knowledge. Acquired knowledge. That's acquired. That was the acquired. What's the other one? Beatific knowledge. Beatific knowledge. So beatific knowledge, the knowledge he possesses by having beatific vision in his human soul. God in, in his human soul. Infused knowledge, God himself creating concepts and placing those concepts in the mind of, of our Lord's human soul. And then acquired knowledge, which is the knowledge that we ourselves as humans naturally gain by our abstractive power, our power to um, abstract the essences of things from sense data. Our Lord had all three of those types of knowledge. So th those are the things we've covered in the past. And today we, we are going to look at um, the imperfections, the imperfections that our Lord willed to assume in his human nature. What manner of imperfections would he, did he will to assume? Um, St. Thomas uses the words, the word defectus. Uh, there, he has a couple of questions on the defects of, of the body of Christ and the soul of Christ. So that's, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so this is Questions 14 and 15 in the Tertia Pars of the Summa. Um, the defects of body and the defects of soul that our Lord wanted to assume. Because what, what we're considering is God's design of the incarnation. What we're considering is the way in which he wanted to redeem mankind. He wanted to redeem mankind by, by becoming flesh, by, by God taking flesh. If you, if you recall, for those of you who are here, maybe, um, I can't remember when this class was, but, but we were talking about the, the, the ways in which God could have addressed the sin of mankind. He, he didn't have to have an incarnation, right? He could have done other things. He could have done nothing, he could have just forgiven us and said, just, just forget about the sins, and I'm going to give you grace anyway. Um, but the way he chose to do it is through uh, taking flesh, taking on a human nature. And, and what, we're, what we're considering is the way in which he willed to take on a human nature. This helps us understand our Lord Jesus Christ, and we have to understand him in order to, um, to be able to love him and serve him in this life. And, and partake of the fruits of the redemption that he's brought us. So this knowledge, hopefully, is helpful for us to know our Lord better, um, to love him more. So 
we, um, we're going to consider the imperfections that our Lord will to assume, the, the incarnation that he designed for his human soul and his human body. <clears throat> I'm going to quote to you um, the Council of Ephesus. It says, if anyone does not confess that the word of God suffered in the flesh and tasted death in the flesh and was made the firstborn from the dead, according to which as God, he is both the life and the life giver, let him be anathema. So there are certain people reading the Gospels, considering the passion and death of our Lord, and they would say to themselves, this could not have happened to God. Um, it's not proper for God to suffer. It's not proper for God to feel pain. So they would say, our Lord must then not have had a real body, or he would not have a body that could suffer. You know how people, if, if their body is numb, even if they're, if they're injured and they're wounded and they're bleeding or whatever, still they are not feeling pain, right? They're not actually feeling pain. So there were certain heretics who um, would come up with, with various ideas in order to say that our Lord did not really suffer. And that's why you have to have this declaration of the Council of Ephesus saying, you, this is something you have to believe as a Catholic, that our Lord actually um, experienced pain and suffered in his body. He suffered in the flesh. He tasted death in the flesh. So you have two heresies I want to point out. One of the heresies is docetism. Docetism said that our Lord did not have a true human body. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't actually a, a human, a real human body. Um, and then you, you have the heresy of monophysitism. Monophysitism is the idea that there is, in fact, only one nature in our Lord, that the, the divine nature kind of swallowed, swallowed up the human nature. In fact, there's only one nature, the divine nature. And since the divine nature cannot suffer, then our Lord did not suffer. These are heresies, and it's not the belief of the Catholic Church. We do believe that our Lord assumed defects or imperfections in his body. What do we mean by defects? Um, there's many different things that, that we can refer to. Um, do we have defects in our bodies? Yes, yes. What, is, what are defects? What, do you th what are the defects he might, he might be talking about? Susceptibility to death, susceptibility to pain, uh, the ability to be injured, to be hurt by things coming from the outside, right? Um, the, the, that when violence is exercised upon you, you uh, can be wounded. You're not invincible, right? Uh, this, is, this is what invincible means. You cannot be conquered. No one can hurt you. Um, so, so there's a certain vulnerability, right? So if you're vulnerable... Then, then that's an imperfection. That's a certain imperfection. It would be, you would be perfect if you were absolutely invulnerable. You couldn't, you couldn't be hurt at all, right? You would be a superior being. Um, any, anything else? Anything else? The, the, the violence comes from the outside. Susceptibility to sickness. The sickness. The sickness, so that you can you can you can get sick. Okay, we would say, well, germs get in you, and that that's from the outside as well. But but um, there there has to be the the weakness of your immune system, the, the a certain inability to fight off things, germs, things that come inside of you on the part of your immune system for you to get sick, right? So. Um, the ability to become sick, to, to contract disease. 
Um, we could speak of like genetic defects. People have genetic defects. Um, we, we could speak of uh, bodily disfigurement. Um, aging. Aging, aging, certainly. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about, mention various imperfections, <coughs> bodily imperfections. And we can going, going to consider with St. Thomas Aquinas, which of these imperfections our Lord willed to assume, and which of them he did not will to, inter, uh, to assume. So <clears throat> one thing we didn't mention were our bodily needs. Such as air, food, drink, sleep, warmth. Um, you have you your body has need of these things, and unless you get these things, your body is going to break down. And you're going to die. You're continually having to take these things in. And if, if you don't, even for a short time, you're going to be toast, right? And that's, that's a certain limitation <coughs> on the part of your body. You would be a superior being if you had no need of these things. Um, we, when we think about the glorified body of the blessed in heaven, those glorified bodies, says St. Thomas, uh, will not need food, will not need drink. Um, th their, their bodies will not require these material things in order to sustain themselves any longer. Whereas here on earth, we do. We do require these things. <clears throat> uh, we've already spoken about subject to outside force. Where you can be harmed... <clears throat> can be harmed. Uh, we call this vulnerability. Then third type, third type of imperfection is sickness, um, where possibility of contracting disease You're not able to ward off disease in all cases. Sometimes you get sick to a greater or lesser degree. And then imperfections of body. Um, yeah, this is an. I don't. I don't know how to say this. These are all called bodily imperfections, but um, you can speak of deformity. Ugliness, um, genetic problems, those sorts of things. I don't know what we could what category we might give those. Um, maybe we'll just call those defects. Bodily defects. So we don't use that word imperfections again. Okay. So this is the question. Unlike us, who were not able to choose our own body or our own parents, right? We, we had no choice in the matter. God didn't give us a catalog beforehand. He's like, okay, which daddy do I want? Oh, he looks good. You know, right here. Uh, yeah, let's use him. <laughs> oh, whoa, price is too expensive. Um, we weren't able to do that. But, but with our Lord, because he's God, he was able to decide exactly how he would exist as a human being. He was able to choose every single modality of his incarnation. 
And we, <clears throat> St. Thomas asks himself the question as to, well, what, what sort of choice did God make in choosing to create the human nature of our Lord? What was, what was the, the sort of highest principle that he followed in choosing the human nature of our Lord? <coughs> uh, what was the number one thing on his mind? When saying, I want to make this human nature. I'm going to decide how it's, it's going to exist. What, what, was, what was the number one thought in the mind of God, according to St. Thomas? Jason? Um, trying, trying to bridge heaven and earth, yeah. the best bridge, the best bridge possible yeah. between heaven and earth. Yeah. That's that's kind of a Franciscan thought. It's it's um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The the Franciscans love that idea. Um, that um, that even if there was no incarnation, if if uh, Adam and Eve had not fallen, then God still would have become incarnate in order to make sort of a crown on his creation and, and bridge heaven and earth. Um, <coughs> St. Thomas basically says, well, it's a moot question. It didn't happen. And the incarnation that we have was not in order to provide a crown of creation. The incarnation we have, what was the reason for the incarnation that we have? For the salvation of mankind. So... <clears throat> So th this is what St. Thomas says is the number one thing on, on the mind of God when he's going to design the human nature of our Lord. He's going to make the best human nature for the salvation of mankind. And you know how the angel says to both Our Lady and St. Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, which means Savior. And when, when, when Scripture gives a name to, to someone, it, it, it kind of in, it indicates their whole identity. No, the whole identity of our Lord, the whole reason for, for the incarnation, for him coming on earth, is for the salvation of mankind. That's, 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 the, that's the purpose. And as a result, if, if that's the reason, then when God creates this human nature, which is going to be called Jesus, then he's going to design it in such a way that it's going to be best fitted to redeem mankind. So, when we come to this question of the imperfections, what, what, is the, what is the best human nature to make to be a savior, to be a messiah? What's, how would that affect God's decisions and, and how our Lord is made? What sort of qualities are the human nature of our Lord going to have in order to be the best <clears throat> redeemer possible, best fitted to accomplish the work of redemption. To be without sin, but also have the capacity to die, which he doesn't have before. Yes, yes. The, to, to be the best redeemer possible, the, the best one, the best one suited to redeem mankind, you need someone who is best able to pay for sin, Right? best able to pay for sin. So that's going to be the holiest person. So in the soul of that person is going to be the holiest. But also to pay for sin, you, you not only need holy acts of worship towards God, right? that's how you're going to pay for sin, but you also have to have the capacity to suffer because that's the payment. So, so there's on the part of the soul, there's this, offering to God this act of worship and on the part of the body there is the thing that it's offered what is being offered is the suffering the the the, the body the life the life is what is being offered and it's it's the the soul that's making the offering so you want the soul to be the holiest soul and you want the body to be a body that can suffer and that even can suffer in, in the most profound way, right? And, and, and that would make the human nature best suited to redeem mankind. 
And this is the guiding principle of St. Thomas when he addresses these questions. And he asks himself, what sort of imperfections did our Lord assume? Um, let me see if I can find <clears throat> this quotation. Um, he, he says, oh, he says, Christ assumed human defects in order to satisfy for the sin of human nature. What has happened? Humans sin. Adam and Eve sinned. Their descendants. So their sons and daughters, their grandchildren, their great grandchildren committed sins, offenses against God. In their human nature, our Lord is going to take on a human nature, and he's going to take it take it on in such a way that he can make up for the sins of human nature. Says St. Thomas in Question 14, Article 4. That's what he says. And this is his guiding principle when he's answering <clears throat> these questions. So first, first question, um, whether the Son of God should have assumed imperfections of body in his human nature. And St. Thomas is going to give three reasons why he should assume defects in his human nature. The number one reason is going to be the reason I've indicated, this, this guiding principle. He has to be a redeemer. To be a redeemer, you have to pay a price. To pay a price, you've got to be able to suffer. Can't pay the price without being able to suffer. So number one reason St. Thomas gives um, is uh, um, the reason for the incarnation <clears throat> was to satisfy for sins. This requires pain and suffering. And, well, to suffer pain, you have to have defects. You have to have those defects uh, that we were talking about. You've got to be able to be wounded, at least, in order to, to suffer. Thank you. I'll take it, give you that one. Um, can we think of any other reason? So that, this is the primary reason in the mind of St. Thomas, and it makes sense. That's the whole point. That's the whole point of the incarnation. Then when God designs the human nature, everything's going to be directed towards that final end. We want a redeemer. We want someone who has the capacity to redeem mankind. Our Lord is only going to have the capacity to redeem mankind if he can suffer. What would be some other reasons that you might think of for our Lord to have these imperfections? Yes, yes. That's also a reason that St. Thomas gives, to give us an example, to provide an example. To give us an example of virtue, especially the virtue of, you might guess, which virtue? It's a good one. That's a good guess, but it's not the one he says. 
close to humility. Um, um, patience. Patience. Yeah. Patience in bearing trials, sufferings. Um, and then and then something else that is often on the on the mind of St. Thomas is that our Lord has to prove that he's a real man. That he's not a fake. He's he's not he's got an actual human nature. It's 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 not some he's not a ghost. He's he's not He's not some Superman that belongs to another race than the human race, but he's a real human. So the third reason is to prove the incarnation. You know, we mean that, that our Lord has a real human nature. You see him suffering. And you see him dying, and you just have to say, well, this is obviously a human being here. This is obviously someone with a human nature, if he can suffer and die. Um, so, those are the three reasons that St. Thomas gives in general why our Lord should assume imperfections in his body. At least some of the imperfections that we were talking about. Before he goes on to consider each of those imperfections in detail. He's going to ask for each one. Did he have assumed this imperfection? Should he have assumed that imperfection? When we, when we think about <clears throat> the, um, the imperfections we were talking about, did, did our Lord manifest that he had bodily needs? In what way? He ate, right? Does the scripture ever say that he was hungry? So. When? When does it say that he was hungry, Rachel? Yes, that's right. After 40 days, after 40 days, not eating, he was hungry. He was hungry. It's obviously miraculous that he was able to go that long, but at, at the same time, he manifests that he's human by, by saying that he was hungry. <coughs> What else does, does uh, scripture how else does scripture manifest that our Lord has real bodily needs? Right? Yes. It, it, it records that our Lord was sleeping. He was sleeping. Right? Um, yes. I thirst. I thirst. Is that what you were going to say, Aaron? <laughs> Okay, you, you're sitting really close to Jason. You're on the same wavelength. <laughs> um, just trying to remember John chapter 4, what it says in John chapter 4. Anybody know what it says in John chapter 4? Um, what does it say? Okay, here we go. <clears throat> he came accordingly to a town of Samaria called Sychar, Near the, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, wearied as he was from the journey, was sitting at the well. He was tired. He was tired. They've been walking all day. He was tired. Okay. So, Scripture definitely manifests that our Lord experiences the imperfections, the same imperfections of the human nature, same needs that, that we experience. What about being subject to outside force? The capacity to be wounded, that's pretty obvious, right? And it's, that's the, the whole passion of our Lord. The very word passion means to suffer, to suffer. So that applied to our Lord. What about sickness? Do we ever hear about our Lord getting sick? having the flu, the fever, or anything like that? You read about that? No. No. We don't read about that. And, and St. Thomas is going to say that um, our Lord had a perfect body. He had perfect genes that he received from Our Lady, um, and he, he was not sick. He did not get sick. That's, that's what... <clears throat> St. Thomas says, 
What about deformity, ugliness, uh, genetic problems, genetic disease? Um, is it that our Lord, do we, we find anything? Yeah. There's, uh, there's some, some of the fathers took scripture rather literally, and they were saying that they thought that our Lord was ugly. Um, yeah. Here's what, what it says in Isaiah chapter 53. You know what's in Isaiah chapter 53? It's like, it's called the fifth gospel, right? It's, it's a prediction of, of the suffering Savior. Here's what it says. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him and like a shoot in the, from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by men, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom men hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. So some of the fathers just like, well, seems like he was ugly. <laughs> seems like he was ugly. <laughs> um, St. Thomas says no. St. Thomas says no. He had beauty as, as it befitted his state and the reverence that is due to his condition. It was Tertullian origin in St. Clement of Alexandria who said that um, he thought he might have been ugly because of that prediction in Isaiah 53. Why would we have, why would we have um, certain grounds to think that our Lord was not ugly? Exactly. Exactly. The Shroud of Turin, Shroud of Turin, um, is not of an ugly man. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, in, in the fourth article that I've already quoted, St. Thomas asks, should Christ have assumed all of the imperfections of the body? Or should he have only assumed some of them? He gives this principle, Christ assumed human defects in order to satisfy for the sin of human nature, and then he draws some conclusions. The purpose of the incarnation is to satisfy for the sin of mankind. So he's going to have to have the most perfect soul in a body that can suffer. St. Thomas says, in order to have the most perfect soul, he had to have no ignorance, no inclination to evil, no difficulty in performing the good. So we're going to see this in, in the other, um, the next question, what, what exactly he means by that. So effectively, he says, our Lord did not assume bodily defects incompatible with the perfection of his soul. So, um, yeah, no bodily defects. that were incompatible with the perfection of his soul. One of these is the way the passions work, the animal passions. The passions belong to our body. The emotions, they belong to our body. There is sense, the sense, what's called the sense appetite, the response of our body to outside stimuli, the, the arousing of, of anger or concupiscence, for instance. So our Lord's body is not going to have passions that are going to work automatically and just push him towards sin. 
but he's, he's going to have a body where the passions are going to be completely subjected to reason. As opposed to us, where our, our passions, they just act. They don't wait for reason to weigh in, but they just act automatically. Yes, of course. It's not to say he has no passions. It's to say that the passions were under the control, the complete control of reason. And we're going to see what, what St. Thomas means by that. Um, he, he, it's what, what he calls having pro-passions. Pro-passions. Sometimes I think I said to my students, you could think of it as professional. <laughs> You're like a professional with the passions. Um, you've got them completely regulated. We spoke about despotic power and political power um, last week, I think it was, or maybe the week before, having despotic power, political power over your passions. Adam and Eve possessed that despotic power until they fell, <clears throat> where the, the passions only acted under the guidance of reason. They did not act on their own. Then secondly, he did not assume defects coming from particular causes, those particular to certain people and not common to the human race. So certain diseases, um, <clears throat> no particular defects coming from particular causes. Like, does our Lord have to experience the fever, the flu, COVID, cancer, heart attack, stroke, you know, like all, all these things, all these particular problems? St. Thomas says, no, no. Now, how would this, how would this connect with his principle? How can he draw this conclusion from his principle that our Lord came, he assumed a human nature in order to make up for the sin of mankind? A disease would put you out of action, so you can't do what your mission is. <laughs> he wouldn't be able to, to, to carry the cross. Um, so... He's referring to the universal scope of our Lord's mission. What does our Lord have to do? He has to save all of mankind. He has to redeem the human race. To redeem human race, the, the human race, he does not have to take on each particular thing that every human experiences, but he has to take on what is common to all humans, is what St. Thomas says. This is, this is how he's drawing it from his principle. Christ assumed human defects in order to satisfy for the sin of human nature. So he's going to assume what all humans assume, but not what this or that human being may undergo. That's what St. Thomas says. Okay. So our Lord, he did assume def all common penalties coming to everyone from original sin. Hunger, death, suffering, thirst, and so on. These penalties, he says, are natural and do not cause any shame. So it's <clears throat> it's not shameful. So for those for those people who are scandalized that 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 God would be taking on a human nature and would be assuming the defects of human nature. 
um, St. Thomas is saying, well, uh, this is this is not below the dignity of, of God. It, it's it's not shameful for him to take on these defects. All right. Does that make sense? It, um, so let's move then to the defects of the soul. Question fifteen. Question fifteen. What sort of defects would our Lord have assumed in his soul? First question, was there any sin in Christ? We've, we've talked about this before. Um, but I think we said it's de fide, that there is no sin in Christ. But we haven't given the reasons yet. Um, first of all, I'm just going to say <clears throat> what, 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 what the main thing we have to do, and the main thing St. Thomas is, is going to want to do, do is say why there was no sin in our Lord, is he's going to go back to here. This is, this is the brilliance of St. Thomas. Um, you can take a treatise on a given topic, and if you can find one sentence in that treatise that is the central principle then you can derive from that, from that one statement, you can derive everything he says in the whole treatise. Which means he is so far up there, he sees the whole thing. He's able to see the central principle and everything that follows from it. And he does that even with, with the Holy Eucharist, you know, when he treats the Holy Eucharist. Um, it's astonishing. It's astonishing. So he's going to want to come back to here and say, especially why our Lord, it's not good for our Lord to have sin if he's going to redeem mankind from sin. But we can always say, already say that it's impossible anyway for our Lord to commit sin. It's incompatible with his very being. He's a divine person. He would have to not be who he was in order to commit sin. If he's God, then, then he cannot go against himself. You know, there's no way for him to go against himself. So it's, it's impossible. Besides that, he has the beatific vision, right? So anyone possessing the beatific vision cannot sin. Cannot sin. Even, even we human beings, if one day, God willing, we, we, we have the vision of God, from that point forward, we will be incapable of sinning because we have the final end before us, it will be impossible for us to choose something over God. We will never do that. Then, also because of the fullness of grace in our Lord's human soul, there was no way he was going to commit a sin. So we could say those things, all right? St. Thomas especially wants to get back to his principle about the incarnation and say, how does this connect to our Lord's mission? Um... He's, he's going to take us back to <clears throat> the three reasons that he gave <clears throat> for our Lord assuming defects. What were the three reasons why our Lord assumed defects? The first reason we said was to redeem mankind. The second reason was given by Xavier. Xavier, what, what reason did you give? Yes, to give us, to, to give us an example of virtue. And the third reason that we gave was what? Third reason that we gave, why? Our Lord would assume defects to prove the incarnation, correct, to prove the incarnation. So, St. Thomas is going to say sin goes against all three of these.
sin goes against the redeeming of mankind because it, it makes it a hindrance to satisfaction. Um, charity is needed for making sacrifices. And sin hinders charity. Sin hinders charity. We need someone who is full of love for mankind, who is willing to sacrifice himself to lay down his life. And a man who has sin is not one going to want to sacrifice himself for others. Right? Secondly, <clears throat> proof of virtues, um, sin is the opposite of virtue. So that's not good. Um, now the third one is the difficult one. You would, you would think, oh, well, to, to err is human, right? They, I mean, you really know this person is human if they make errors, right? right? Um, this is a tough one. How, how can St. Thomas say that, that sinning somehow is not good to prove that our Lord is human? Um, <clears throat> it's a very interesting reason he gives, and it does make sense. He says, sin is contrary to reason. Reason is the highest faculty of man. Um, we are supposed to be reasonable. In other words, let's just say when we are sinning, we're not being reasonable and we're not being our true self. My true self is to be a rational animal. But when I sin, I go against my own reason, and I somehow step below humanity. I go lower than my human state by being irrational and working against myself. So when you commit a sin, um, it's, not, it's not manifesting your humanity, it's manifesting something less. Um, <clears throat> humans are made to be rational but it's irrational <clears throat> to commit sin okay so no sin, no sin in our Lord. Um, <clears throat> then then St. Thomas asks <clears throat> about another defect of human nature, and this is called the fomes peccati. That is the kindling. of sin. Does our Lord have the kindling of sin, the thing that, that makes us, that, that inclines us towards sin, that pushes us towards sin? No. That requires him to have an aspect of fallen nature. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's precisely what comes to us from our fallen nature because we had original sin. We have this fomes peccati where we are inclined towards what is evil. Um, so this is what I was talking about <clears throat> with, um, with regards to Adam and Eve and the passions and the question of the pro-passions. Um, we're going to, so we, we would say our Lord has these poor passions. He has the same despotic power that Adam and Eve had 
in the garden where their passions were totally subject to their reason. Our Lord did not have this inclination of the sensual appetite to what is contrary to reason. So this is the inclination of the sense appetite to what is contrary to reason. Our Lord did not have this. He had the passions, but the, he had them in a higher way than what, what we have. So he had what are called pro-passions, what did I do with the eraser? Um, I never know what, where I put things. I'm teaching a class. Um, I don't think so. Oh, it's under here. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the pro-passions, pro-passions, Let's explain the characteristics of the pro-passions. Our Lord had the passions. He had emotions. He had love. He had desire. He had anger. Um, he had fear, says St. Thomas. But all of these emotions were subject to reason. First of all, their objects their object the objects to which they tended were always lawful Yes. Uh, it wasn't just his um, perfect integrity of, of reason over passion, but it was also his reason, his faculty of reason, had, had the benefit of him being God as well. In other words, it wasn't just strictly human reason, right? Or was it? It was strictly human reason, but it had the three types of knowledge that we explained last time, right. and it had all knowledge. So. It's true that even if our passions are okay in a given situation, we still have to know what is right. We still may do something wrong in ignorance, right? And that will harm us, even though it may not be subjectively sinful. And this never happened with our Lord, because he always knew what was right. Um, so the objects to which they tended were always lawful. We may, we may have, um, have had a good meal, and then we see a piece of chocolate cake, and our passions immediately might go out for that, what it might, might want it. Or we see an indecent picture, and the passions immediately incline towards that indecency. Um, this is the automatic acting of our passions, they simply respond to the objects for which they are made. Just like that. They automatically respond to the objects for which they are made without considering the context of whether this object is lawful or not at the current moment. What we're saying, our Lord's passions were not like that. They would not move towards a thing that was unlawful, even if it was what that passion is made for. What would normally stimulate that passion, in his case, would not. Um, so then the principle, the principle of these passions, <clears throat> they always follow the judgment of reason.
followed. They never went before. Our passions go before reason. He only felt the emotions when he wanted to. When his reason gave the green light. With us, the passions always have the green light. Or we may be giving them a yellow. You know, if we've, if we've developed virtue, we give them, we got a yellow. And there is certain, they have to be stimulated powerfully for them to run wild if, if we're virtuous. Um, then lastly, the effect. The effect <clears throat> of the passions, they never hindered the reason of our Lord. Which our passions do. When we're really excited, when we're very fearful, we're very angry, we're very hungry, we're very fatigued, then we find it hard to think. It's hard to, hard to think clearly. It's like, I, uh, don't bother me right now. I just can't really think right now. Uh, don't ask me any questions, sort of thing. You know, when, when, we're, when we're really emotional, this never happened with our Lord. <clears throat> um, okay. So, our Lord had the passions, but they were completely under the control of his reason. So there's um there's an interesting objection. You know when when all when St. Thomas considers all of these questions, he always has a number of objections. And one of the objections to this, that the, the our Lord not having the fomes peccati, one of the objections says, Well, death, suffering, and the fomes peccati, they all come from the same source. If our Lord had the first two, death and suffering. He should have the fomes as well. They all come from original sin. Death, suffering, and the inclination of the passions to sin all come from original sin. If our Lord had the first two, death and suffering, he should also have the third, says the objection. Yeah. So... When St. Thomas answered this, answered this, he makes a distinction. He says, death and suffering pertain to the vegetative power of our soul. That, that this is our, the power we have to nourish ourselves, to stay in good health, and so on. Um, your, your health of body, it pertains to your vegetative powers. Digestion, you know, breathing, sleeping, eating, drinking, those sorts of things. Whereas the passions pertain to the sensitive power, um, your sensation. And the, when, you, when your vegetative power breaks down, they do not imply moral disorder. Like, um, you don't say, well, they got the flu. They must have committed a big sin. You know, they need to go to confession. She's got the flu. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't say that. You don't say that. But when someone flies into a rage, you know, or they're just sitting on their couch all day long, he was like, well, that's, that's a moral disorder. That's sinful. That's sinful. So the suffering and death do not imply moral disorder. They pertain to your vegetative functions, whereas the imperfections of the sensitive appetite do imply moral disorder. If you're letting your passions run wild, you let your passions go, then you're committing sin. You're committing sin. Um, <clears throat> so that's that's how St. Thomas answers these objections. And, and what happens when, when you when you read the objections is like you understand things a bit more deeply. You know, the objections help clarify things, help sharpen um, the explanations that, that were given. 
he goes on and he considers <clears throat> whether um, our Lord had sensible pain, whether there was sadness in our Lord, whether there was fear, and whether there was wonder, and whether there was wrath or anger in our Lord. But uh, we do not have time to get into those tonight. Um, but what the, the picture we must have is that in our Lord's human nature, you have someone who is perfectly fitted to become our Redeemer. Someone who is most perfect in his soul, completely sinless, completely regulated in his passions, but then also on the side of his body, he has a most perfect body, but one that is subject to suffering. St. Thomas is going to explain when he comes to the Passion that, he, he, that he's going to try to prove that our Lord suffered more than anybody else, um, precisely because of, the, of his ability. He had a greater ability to feel pain than most of us because his body was so refined. His body was so sensitive. Like the, the more perfect your senses are, the more you can suffer from being injured, right? Because you feel it. You feel it more than other people. So, okay, what's the question? How do we explain the virtue of the ignorant in saints like Joseph of Cupertino and the sinfulness of the educated in people like Marx, who spent an average of 17 hours a day in study and developing his mind? Wouldn't the more developed mind be naturally less inclined to sin? Is it not the object of the matter that is studied that really counts as well? Yeah. Um, you know, this was the position of Socrates. Socrates equated knowledge with virtue. Knowledge is virtue. So he had this idea that, that if you knew the truth, then necessarily you were going to be a good person automatically. All right, but um, what he did not consider is that there is another faculty besides the intellect, and that is the faculty of the will that chooses. So knowledge alone is not sufficient to be a virtuous man. You must also um, will to accomplish what is true, to live up to the truth, to choose according to what is true. And Marx was an immoral man. Um, I just saw the other the other day he had, he had a child by his maid while he was married to his wife, and he he did not support this child or, or anything. Um, and he had the maid pretend it was it was his friend's child, you know. So this man was was horribly immoral. Um, so knowledge alone is not sufficient to be virtuous, but more knowledge is more helpful to virtue. It can be more helpful to virtue. It can be also more helpful to vice. Think about the criminal. You have the, the cleverest man, the man who knows better than anybody else um, how cars work. Um, you know, he's like the James, uh, the uh, Jason Bourne of criminals. Um, he's, he's just so skilled. His knowledge is going to be used for evil better than other criminals. Um, whereas if you have a saint, um, the saint jo Joseph Cupertino and the Curie of ours, um, they did not have a lot of sort of abstract, philosophical, intellectual knowledge, but they had divine knowledge. And you find saints, uh, you know, St. Catherine Siena is one I gave last, last week, find saints who were not educated, but they had divine knowledge, and that's something superior. They, so they did have knowledge. They didn't have the knowledge that we typically speak of, but they had a higher knowledge that was given to them by God through their prayer. Um, and that, that assisted them in, in becoming saints. All right, so let's um, say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Lady, help of Christians, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, Father. Okay.